This is Chris Duffin at Elite Performance Center. I've got powerlifting legend Ed Cohn with me today. How you doing, guys? So uh, Ed, uh, Ed's out here. We're working on uh, he, uh, some shoulder issues. So he's got some uh, shoulder firing issues. And, and uh, so we've actually been working through the entire chain, though, because a lot of people don't realize that it, it, just focusing on that one area of dysfunction or where the pain is, oftentimes is you're lost if that's where, where you're starting at. So we've been working through that whole chain, and uh, it's been a, a good experience. We've had some really good success. Eye-opening experience. And uh, we've made some uh, really good uh, progress in the, in the Actually, time here. Actually, pretty unbelievable, uh, unbelievable progress where, I, you know, when you get a massage, or you, a lot of times you just go to an old-school chiropractor, and people that don't think outside the box or learn, they work on that area. But that's not what caused the problem. It could be something down here that causes posture problems, breathing problems, structural problems because of that. It's like a domino effect. And I've been learning that from him. And he showed me a lot of, a lot of stabilization issues that I have that I didn't know. And we've, uh, we've seen some pretty immediate uh, changes on a lot of this, too. So uh, we've got some things reset. And uh, you can actually see it in the way he stands. He gets up, moves. It's pretty... Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, before when I'd be laying on the ground, I'd get up, I'd get up like an, like an old guy, like an old powerlifter that's beat up that what I was. Then all of a sudden, after we worked for one hour on certain little things, all of a sudden I'd bounce back up. I'm, my eyes are open. I'm standing straight up. I feel my glutes firing. One of them wasn't really firing before, aside that I had a hip replacement on. And that old school of thought was, well, to reset a, a bad motor pattern or something, it took like X amount of thousands of reps and stuff like that. And what I'm learning now is it, it doesn't. You can start resetting it right away. And it's opened up my my mind uh, tremendously, and I thank very much thank you for that. And, and I want to thank Ed. So it's been a, it's been a collaboration. So um, he, uh, he worked with me on my deadlift this morning, and I've really been struggling with – I've got some really big poles with straps in the gym. And I've really been struggling with my setup without those this last few years and being able to get that tight and right in position. And, uh, you know, Ed gave me some ideas this morning and I worked with those and I'm really, really pleased. I was able to get Perfect. right into the position. That you would normally get into with straps. That's why guys pull most so much more with straps is they find that right position that feels right. But when they grab the bar without straps, they can't get that position and everything changes. It becomes a different lift and that's why 100%. People, people always ask me, why, why, why is that differential so much? I'm like, well, they're two different lifts. Yeah. And uh, so, so anyway, that's been, that's been really beneficial uh, for me and uh, hopefully we may have a chance that... Uh, I, trust me, I came out ahead. So. <laughs> I just, you know what, it, being, being like an, an older guy now and been in the sport for so long and beat up because I allowed myself to get beat up because nobody knew the stuff that you're doing. All the stuff that you, you and the other doctor are doing is like way new stuff applied to lift heavier lifting in athletics that people just did for old rehab people or something like that. They didn't realize how it applies to real functionally functioning high level athletics. And uh, it's like I said, it's it's opened up my eyes. It's opened up my mind. And uh, I will continue to do this forever. Now, just a few little things here and there every week. And all of a sudden, everything's firing the way it's supposed to. So in the long run, what do you think effect that has on your performance over a long term? And long term can only be six months. Just look at long term. You, you get a few different training cycles in. And what, what happens at the end when you don't have any dysfunction in your body and everything's working how it's supposed to? So it's easier to get in position in the squat, bench, and deadlift, or power clean, or it's easier to run because all of a sudden your hamstrings, your glutes, your your back, your your shoulders, everything's firing at the same time. Look at what happens. Just think. So Ed, I, I appreciate the confidence that uh, you had in me in coming out here to to work on this stuff, and you've actually gotten to see now what a lot of other people haven't seen and actually learned some of the background stuff because people watch my videos and the stuff I put out there, but You've now seen there's a whole lot more actually in there in the methodology and it's, stuff. It's it's so complicated but so easy at the same time. Like, you know, it's from from my my point of view, it's so easy because I didn't have to learn it like you, but you know the, all the intricacies and you're an engineer, so everything you learn and the angles and how you have to watch it and what you have to look for to learn is so much more than 
I I have to know. But but when he puts me through it, bam, it happens just like that. It's like holy shit. And and I learned for because I saw I, I watched some of your videos. Um, I talked to Stan Efferding, Mark Bell. Uh, I watched Spoto use the the shoulder rock, and uh, I figured you know. I gotta. I, I love to learn. I love lifting. If I want to lift for a long period of time, pain free, it doesn't mean I have to lift a million pounds. But if I can lift pain free and have fun doing it, and the only reason it's going to be fun if it's if it's pain free, is if I learn more. So here I am, and I'm learning more. And I a thumbs up to Chris. I would actually advise everyone to to listen to him and get whatever information he puts out. Thank you, Ed. And and on that though, I don't have all the answers. So no, clear. but it, it, but see, you, you you search and you try to find them, so you don't think like everyone else. You don't say this is the only way to do it and that's it. No, because it's always evolving. There's new stuff coming out all the time, and that's what you know. But for right now, what you're doing is freaking phenomenal that I've never seen anyone else do before because it hasn't been done. Well, actually, and that is a, a very valid point. So no one is doing. What we're doing here right now and and i say that in the sense of with performance strength athletes yes so this methodology and approach in the uh that i that i'm putting in place is very clinical based it's used in a lot of the rehab performance worlds but not in the environment that we're doing and it still takes some further refinement and how we do that how we employ it how we coach and cue it but when you put it together you can do some pretty amazing things people have looked at the progress on my lifts in the last few years and they're Man, you're getting stronger. I haven't gotten that much stronger. I've been much more efficient at putting that hard bar. And you see that. I mean, watch the videos of some of the lifters that tag me that train at EPC. You know, there's some pretty phenomenal stuff. We don't have, we're not recruiting big athletes. We take people that have no experience or just getting into the sport and we build them. Uh, but you're building from them from, community. from the ground up, not where they, like, what I learned in powerlifting, okay, I put myself in these positions and everything works out for a certain period of time. But you're working with them from the beginning stages to make their body move right, which yes. is different. So the, the whole, like my whole coaching concept of what we employ here is all, it's kind of, everybody coaches the peripheral. They coach to what a squat and deadlift should look like and how you put your body in the positions to be that, which is important to understand that. And that's something that Ed was able to help me with on some stuff today. But what we coach is, what are the core things that need to be happening at the root? And we start at the base from breathing and stabilization. And, and then once we get that down, we actually move then to transferring power and moving through the hips, through the shoulders. And uh, it, 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 it's crazy. You look at, like, a lot of times it takes, a, you know, a six months to really get somebody that's never squatted before to do a beautiful powerlifting mm -hmm. squat. We do that in 15 minutes. And I kid you not. Sometimes that takes a little bit longer, depending on someone's athleticism. But we teach those fundamentals. Watch, them have, watch some of the videos first that we've got on our, our private page. And then we refine that with, like, a little coaching in the gym. And then we say, okay, now mm -hmm. you're going to sit back. With, while doing that, all these things, here's the points, boom, 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 boom. Sit back between your legs. And everything have, happens how every, it's supposed to. You don't have to physically make it happen. It just happens. Exactly. Like, here, here's, here's, here's funny for some people. But, you know, as, as beat up as I've been, and a lot of lifters will understand this, is I got up this morning, out of bed like that. Funny, but I went to sit on the toilet. You know, it's like, oh, God. I sat on a toilet like a perfect squat, and both hips went down perfectly at the same time, at the same angle. It was like, I had no pain doing that. Oh, my God, this is great. <laughs> and, you know, the little things in life you start to appreciate. But you start noticing a difference, like I said, but from when I got up off the floor, I bounced up like I was a kid again. That but, was pretty fun watching you get off the mat yesterday. You, he, he actually he got back down because he's like, I got to do this again. Jump yeah, back up again. Jump back up. It's like, great. <laughs> But like you know, it's, Rome wasn't built in a day. I'll, I'll we'll have a little program that I go through where I do some of this stuff uh, three, four times a week, uh, along with the shoulder rock to start loosening up those shoulders that w that we've been working on. And uh, all of a sudden, stuff will start firing the way it's supposed to, 
and get put in the back in the position it's supposed to. Because as you know, like Chris and I were talking, when your body starts getting injured, it'll still find a way to press a weight or to lift your arm or to squat or whatever, but it won't be using everything in the right movement it's supposed to. So sooner or later, that really bad movement that you've been doing on the inside, even though it technically looks good on the outside, breaks down. Yeah, and that's a lot of what we dealt with here in this process. He came with, a, okay, I need to work at my shoulders. And we started looking at where the dysfunctions were that weren't causing pain. There's and a lot of it was actually, it, it was based off of the, not the hip replacement itself, but probably yeah. the couple of years leading into the hip replacement yeah. where he was doing some things to, to. Yeah, where it changed everything. And so those patterns were, were a lot of what we, uh, yeah. what we addressed. Yeah. Well, uh, cool. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really cool opportunity to have you two here. A lot of people put you in the same boat. Um, you know, well, we're both good lifters. Yeah, both really good lifters, world records to your name, one from the last generation, yet you're here and you're full of life, and that's really cool. So I'm just going to ask a couple questions, things that I think people will be Shoot. really interested in hearing about. What have you been up to lately? Uh, well, <laughs> trying to stay healthy, which doesn't, you know, it, you don't, you only think you know how. You know, stretching and doing a little bit of this or that, a massage. And you're pain-free when you walk out of the place for a few minutes. And then the pain comes back because we didn't get at the root of what caused it. And that's what we did here. That's what I had to learn. And just, it's, there's no pride. It's not like you have to swallow your pride. It's like, if I want to get better and have no pain, I got to do what's right for me. But as, as far as everything else, I, I trained some people. I got a little real estate. Like I told Chris, uh, I, I started fighting only to... Uh, get my body moving again, to feel a little bit more athletic, to be like an athlete again. And I really enjoy it. It's, 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 it's funny because the, the style of fighting I learned, the real, like, real violent stuff, um, it actually calms you down. But it, it's good to not be one-dimensional anymore. Because when we were all younger, we grew like weeds and our list went up like crazy because we were so athletic and mobile. We have no impingements or scar tissue or anything like that anymore. So that's what I'm trying to get back to. That's what I lost because I became such a one-dimensional athlete that it screwed me up after a period of time. So you just uh, you had a speaking of injuries and uh, you had a hip surgery recently. About uh, well four and a half years ago, I had a hip replacement. How has that affected you or, or your future? Well, it, it it affected more leading up to it because I I did it didn't wait do it right away when I was in a ton of pain. I waited two years, so I was on crutches, so it was completely destroyed. But uh, my doctor, Tishland in Norway, Nimi, thanks doc. I've never had a problem since, never had pain since. He just said, you can squat and deadlift whatever you want, just don't run and jump. I was like, story of my life already. I don't have to change anything. And uh, it's been fantastic ever since that. So uh, I think a lot of people were surprised uh, to see you lift in Sydney as a guest lifter. How was that experience? I didn't really lift, I did a token squat. Um, I hadn't done a low bar squat in a while, in like two and a half months. And uh, the night before, uh, Wayne Howlett came up to me and said, "You know, some of the Russians can't squat like they want, that like they plan to. Would you do a token squat?" And I said, "Sure." And then I started thinking about it. I started getting scared to death. I'm standing there like this, my my legs starting to go. My girlfriend looks at me. She goes, "What's the matter?" I said, "I feel like I'm going in a meet again." I hadn't been on a platform in four and a half years, or seven and a half years. So uh, I started thinking about more and more, I was nervous as hell. And then, uh, you know, I, I warmed up, nice relaxed warm up, and uh, I just did 661 with just a belt on. And when I walked it out, I felt like I was back home again. It was so nice and easy. I'm pretty sure I could have done like 750 that day, but 661 real easy let everyone go wow that was easy and i walked out the platform happy and glad it was over with and someday again if i get healthy enough i'd like to just go without you know because because of the fact i had a hip replacement with no knee wraps just walk out 800 dunk it walk it back in and say anything is possible uh how was it to meet uh, some of the current uh, greats in the sport well, I've never met Chris before. He's actually a way nicer guy in person than he is on video. But uh, some guys I've known, 
Uh, some of the Russians I've never met. I've never met uh, Kirill or KK. I never met Zahir. You know, Zahir, you, you see his videos, you think he's this crazy, mean dude. He's the nicest guy in the world. You almost got to push him off you from stop the hugging you. He's a very nice, passionate guy. Him and his wife are really nice. Uh, KK is, uh, he opens up his mouth and you're like, yes, sir. No, sir. He's so very intense. Nice guy. Um, Kirill is just a monster. He's like 24 years old. So uh, him and Spoto will be battling for a while for the bench record. And uh, I'd never met uh, Pazdiev, who was nice. Didn't really speak a lot of English, but he was nice. And, and uh, I'd met Balev once before, but didn't talk to him. And uh, he was very nice. And there's so many other lifters that, you know, if you never met them, they're still lifters. So it doesn't matter if they have records. So it's, re it's really nice to be able to travel and meet people and have people be nice. So it, it sounds like uh, you, you're still interested in uh, competing or you still have... Uh, no, I'm still interested in doing a couple things, not competing. The only competing I have to do is uh, with myself. I don't want to get so far into it where I say, oh, well, I'm going to try to get this record or that record. I'm not into it. That's for the current guys that are nice and healthy and I don't need to prove myself or prove it to myself, um, which I'm happy at. Um, do I think I could lift some big weight if I get healthy? Yeah. But uh, I don't know if I, part of me wants to do it, and then I'm, I start, and it's like, I don't know if I really want to do it that bad. So it's just being healthy and it being me and being happy. That's all that matters. But besides that, uh, you mentioned a little earlier to me that you're, you're still involved in the sport in other ways, traveling around. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, I do, I do a, I've been doing a bunch of workshops this last year, late year and a half, and uh, I like helping people. It's so gratifying when you fix someone's lift. And you see their eyes open up and everything is perfect. It's, 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 it's I mean, you, you get paid for it, but it's, it's worth more than money. And then you, you start developing friendships with people from all over the world. And that journey from where I started is worth more than any trophy or world record. That's way, way, way worth it. So uh, you kind of touched on this a little earlier, but... Uh... How'd you hear about Chris, and uh, what do you think? First impressions of uh, the team environment here and his coaching. He got a big, he got a big happy family. Everyone supports each other, which is what you want to see. Which is everyone can get better. Everyone, when anyone was doing a big lift, everyone was there for him. Everyone stopped, and everyone stopped for another person. You're all there for each other. That's what it's all about. It's a, it's a great atmosphere to, to learn to get strong. Well, thanks for answering questions, Chris. A couple for you. Uh, you started in the sport when Ed was in his prime, or just about, right? Uh, yeah, it was about 15 years ago. Uh, so what did you know about him back then, or what did you think of him? How did you... Well, uh, I've been pretty much in the same weight classes the entire time that, uh, that uh, I've lifted. And so obviously Ed's name has been, you know, right there because he's the one that's you know, he's owned the records, sets the standards, and, uh, you know, it was, you know, early in my career, you know, it, obviously I knew who he was, and it's just like, here's that, that, that gold standard of something that may never be achievable, and as I continued to, to progress, it was, you know, watching some of his, watching his videos, um, you know, reading things on his approach, and, and, you know, it's been, you know, I've always wanted, I've always wanted to break an Ed record. Never come close, but I, but I've always wanted to. Um, We're still time. <laughs> and uh, so it's you know it's kind of surreal at the same time to 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 sit here and spend the time that we've spent in the last couple of days with with Ed and and you know and also find so many common interest and themes. I mean, very much you know what he's talking about with the helping and coaching people and the. I mean, I'm so passionate about it. That's why I put out the content that I do and I help wherever I can. Um, and, uh, and it, that's just something I enjoy about the sport in general is the authentic people that are in it. They're in it for the right reasons. Uh, they're grounded, they're authentic. And at that high level, you know, all those people are, you know, they're supporting each other yeah. as, a, as a team. Even if you're competing against each other, I can say, I want to break an Ed record. But that's right. not that's not anything against Ed, and he knows exactly where I'm coming from, and he'll probably be cheering me on if I ever had a shot at it. Yeah, why not? So uh, that that 
that's that's something I really respect about the sport, and uh, you know, and, and that ex exemplifies that. Yeah, we, we we talked earlier. Our our approach to training is is very much the same. Where we we step back, we say, okay, these are my weak points. I got to get these stronger to build a bigger base, and my form has to be right, and I got to take my time because from here to here, I can't jump steps or something's going to happen, which we try to teach a bunch of other people we know. Yeah. Amit, that's you. <laughs> There's a lot of new lifters in the sport that are enthusiastic. You know, enthusiastic, And this sport is not NASCAR. Yeah. It doesn't happen at 200 miles an hour. You've got to be in it for the long run. Dot day. your I's and cross your T's and you'll get there. Don't try to run up that flight of stairs, five stairs at a time, or else you slip and fall and hurt yourself. Relax. If it takes a couple extra months during a training cycle to get there, you get so many things stronger with no mistakes, no injuries. If you get hurt, you can't lift. It, it costs you two or three months or even more sometimes of pain and suffering to try to heal yourself again. It's not worth it. And that's something that, you, you know, you asked that question, that's something I've looked up to in Ed, is that he wasn't a guy that showed up on the sport, did something big and disappeared. Because we see that all the time. We see oh, this is going to be the next big guy, the next big person. Yeah. He exemplifies that, stay in the course and being strong. It's a for journey. That, for that long period of time. And that's what makes a legend. All right. So, uh, wow, thank you. That was a, that was a really cool response. Uh, so talking about methods, uh, Chris, people, or recently you've been called uh, the mad scientist of powerlifting because of your unique approach and you know background as an engineer and how... You tinker and you get your you get your um, you know T's crossed and your eyes dotted. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that about the method? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but uh, what what makes it different from you know typical ways of teaching the powerlifting movements? So um, yeah, I did touch on that a little bit earlier, but um, I draw from a lot of different areas. I call it a steel, or whatever you want to say, but very analytical and looking at a lot of different things and trying to draw the key pieces that make sense in all this maze of different ideas and things and go, let's distill this down in one of the key components. How do we make that work? And then how do we actually explain that in a manner that we can easily coach and get that transfer, that knowledge transferred over easy? You don't want to try to appear smart by, you know, some, some, you know, complex dissertation. People are just going to fall asleep. It has to it has to actually be applicable to them. Right. It can't just be something you're spewing out of knowledge that sounds right. It actually has, it actually has to be able to be done. If someone can't do it, they'll, they won't do it or get there. So it, it's, and it really comes down to what we talked about. It's, I don't coach the peripheral. I don't coach where your knee should be and this and that. And we coach the things that need to be happening. Knee position is controlled by the glute, the MO balance, which that glute isn't firing correct, if the core's not stable, there, it's, there, there's this process and chain. And if we work all this stuff and make that work right, all this shit on the peripheral, excuse my language, happens because actually you can have the knee in the right position and it's not doing, and your body isn't doing what needs to be happening. And uh, so I've, I've been, a lot of what I've been stealing is from several different schools in the, the clinical real rehab world. And refining that and putting that place in some specific cueing strategies related to our sport and how we get there. So there's a, you know, there's a coaching methodology um, for prepping people on some of the basics for breathing and spinal stabilization, which leads to reduce back trauma, um, but also can lead to, that's where a lot of the basic stuff that ends up going wrong with, you know, the hip isn't in the right position or you're having hip issues and you can have knee problems and shoulder and elbow and you know, that's how I got there myself, my, my destroyed body. And uh, it's what sent me down that, that path. And uh, so I've spent a lot of very focused time with finding the key people in those fields that know the stuff that I want to learn and learning from them, but doing it in a collaborative manner, knowing that, hey, they're not going to, you know, I'm not going to want to find the person with the ego that says, this is the way. I want to find the person that goes, these are some great concepts. I'm not sure how that applies here. And let's try and let's work together. 
And so it's been a very collaborative uh, effort over the last few years with a few key people to figure out how that works. And then, you know, my piece is how do we coach? How do we cue that? How's the approach to that? Um, and then uh, most of my assessment and correction is all done within the key lifts versus going out with, you know, a, a variety of different tests. But we did different tests today because I wanted to have some very specific time. I'm like, uh, with my own athletes, I don't actually do a lot of the stuff that we do with, that we did with Ed because. Because I'm broken. <laughs> he's broken, but I would be able to actually see that stuff happening if yeah. I was watching you deadlift, mm -hmm. watching you squat, and being able to actually do a lot of the corrections and then saying, here's the homework piece, here's this and that, mm -hmm. um, which we'd be able to actually identify on all those core lifts. Yeah. Um, by watching those, those levers, those angles, and going, here's what's happening. Okay, I can see that glute's not firing. That adductor has issues. We've got some issues in the transverse plane. On so the we side. did a few little other so, exercises, and all of a sudden, by the end, we went back to those. All of a sudden, it's firing and it's stronger. Yeah, and that's a and that's a that's a key you know thing that I've stolen from the clinical side is test and retest. So we started with you know this is we test and find okay we've got issues. We played through a bunch of different areas. We pulled out that from that. Here's some things that work and we're finding a difference. And we retest, make sure are we having. Are we actually doing something? So, so that's why, you, yeah, yeah, you keep retesting it. But I wouldn't call it stealing. I would say you learned it and you're applying it because you give credit to them. So stealing would be if you didn't give credit to them. Yes. So, so it's, and, called, and, it's and, called learning. Yeah, and, and I, in my videos, I refer a lot of to where it's from. So uh, dynamic, dynamic neuromuscular stabilization from the Prague School of Me Medicine. Uh, some of the uh, assessment stuff that we went through today was uh, uh, from FMS. Um, we did, uh, there was some PNF stuff, some PNE, and um, so just a lot of different things that we kind of pull from. And, uh, like I said, it's, yeah, I, I don't make this up. No, but you're, I, apply, I have, you're applying it different I'm applying it. than what it was normally meant for. And those, those people are saying, yeah, go ahead, try to work at it and let us know and we'll help you out. And the piece that I do create is actually the. Once we work through and talk about, you know, this is what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. How do we cue it in the sequence that we cue it as you walk into a squat? And like you've seen some of that with, I did a, a coaching video with the meet. Mm -hmm. Well, you saw the five things that I was telling him to do, but each of those five things may have been 45 minutes of work that we did first explaining. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's one cue because we don't want to make this complicated. I mean, you got five things we're going to do. That's it. Mm -hmm. But each of those five has, has a lot of depth to it. But when you walk up to the bar, you can't have. But you have you have to have done it the same way so many times to have it just happen. Yes. And as long as you do that the same way every time, there's no bit more. There's no outside variables that can happen wrong. Whether it's you know, a hundred pounds or a thousand pounds, it's you know it's you're set and you're in the position to be able to lift that weight. But I think uh, I think uh, Stan Efferding came up with the uh, mad scientist term started texting me that, you know, and then, uh, but, uh, you know, I, it, I think that's just, I do think I never accept perfection. Always trying to get there, trying to get better. And just that one little step for that little step further. And that's why I end up exploring a lot of these different ideas, but you'll notice that I, I don't every month. I'm not the guy that has, Oh, here's the new thing. Oh, here's the new thing. Uh, and people always ask me, I see you doing this in your training and I see you doing this. Can you ex please explain it and explain why? No. Because I haven't, I haven't done it for six months or a year, and I can't tell you that I know for sure that this is going to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm just not going to talk about it because I don't want you to. I'm not, I'm not supporting this yet. I, you know, I want to stick with basics and try to keep it simple. I, I, I maybe do stuff that is kind of off the wall for most people, or just very different and outside the box. But it's not. Oh, here's the next and idea of the day. Everybody is an individual too. So. Everyone has some of the same cues, but you can't help someone just by an email and have them and and say this is what's wrong with you. No, you you'd have to physically work with them because everybody is different with different problems and different maladies or whatever. Yeah, I told I told Ed before we started yesterday. I said eighty percent of the stuff that we mess around with or better is going to be crap. We're not going to get anywhere with it. We're going to reach a lot of dead ends. That's part of the process. That's fine. And that's why you can't send me a message going, hey, uh, my left hip pain is popping, and what's the answer? 
Oh, I don't know. It could be, it could be your ankle. You know, you don't know. It's I don't usually know. not the hip. It's usually not the hip. It's something so, else causing that. But so. you know, we, and, and we talked earlier about our, our training methodology, and it's like, okay, you're gonna. It's all of it is some type of progressive resistance in some way. And move, move uh, right and add, add load. And as long as you're in that right position and your body's healthy, you're in a position to be able to lift that weight. As long as you haven't selected stupid numbers and overtrained and and stuff like that. So a lot of it works if you do it right. And that's that's not my way. I have I have ebooks. He has his own way. Uh, Louis Simmons, Brandon Lilly, Chad, Wesley Smith, all these people have their own ways and all of it can work as long as you throw your ego out the window and say, I want to get better. Not, I mean, one, one of your girls asked me, did you set out thinking that you were going to lift a thousand pounds or whatever? She said, no, I lifted every cycle to try to get better. That's it. And it's just that cycle lasted 28 years of trying to get better. <laughs> And in, in, in the end, you're going to be really damn good if that's all you thought about. Because you didn't, you didn't try to, like you said, NASCAR. You didn't try to, you weren't in a race. You are in a long journey to try to make yourself stronger and happier over a long period of time. And that's the only way to get there. Yeah, thank you guys. That's really good. Uh, Chris, uh, one of the products of your mad science persona is this mystical device called the shoulder rock. How did it come about? And uh, it's one of the reasons that is here. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, yeah, so the shoulder rock is, uh, is a play on a, uh, uh, on a device that's been around for hundreds of years. It uh, uh, was used for fighters, uh, for shoulder health. And actually, Ed gave me some little background in it because he's got some experience in fighting. Uh, but uh, I've taken a, uh, uh, you know, we've got new materials. Um, and, so I'm able to offer a product that's that's better than what's been out there in the past. So there's a lot of refinements on the product, length, knurling, loading using, you know, easily devices that we've got. So you don't have to purchase a whole bunch of them. So you can have uh, micro loading makes a big difference on this. They're small jumps. You don't want to have to have. Oh, my God. We had, we had five pounds on there today. And he said, well, you know, I want to put a little bit more weight on to see how it feels. He put two and a half pounds on. It felt like he put a 50 pounder on there. That's. The difference, but the difference ends up being how he uses it compared to other people uses it. Yeah, used it before, so it's way different. So that's and that's the piece that we're that, that really makes it different is the approach. So I'm one. I'm I, I like quality products. It's the best quality product of, of that type out there. It's designed specifically for what we're trying to do in barbell sports. You don't have to worry about loading sand, buying a whole bunch of different products. You know, one. It's not like a sled. Go swing a sledgehammer if you want. We've got a bunch of them in this gym. I've tried that years ago. Didn't work. You're just gonna just the tired. balance. It doesn't work right. You're um, tired. It, well, yeah, it can work. Just like you can go to a regular gym if you want to be a thousand pound squatter and use a regular gym bar. And yeah, see how that goes for you. It, it'll work. But if you're serious about squatting, that's not what you do. Um, but the it's tied in with actually a lot of that movement approach that we we've done. So there's a very specific cueing sequence with what we're trying to accomplish. Because when that product was originally developed hundreds of years ago, they didn't have the issues that we've got with open chain movement in barbell sports and the issues that it has on shoulder health. So my approach is very specific to dealing with those issues. Um, and even without that, you know, barbell sports, it is, you know, we're getting back to those, some of those basic DNS fundamentals of that core stability and having the shoulders plugged into that and getting that whole system and chain actually operating better instead of focusing on just this pain. Yeah, the little stuff we did last night, <laughs> before I was going to bed at your house, I looked in the mirror with my shirt off. My abs were f flat and tight as hell. Like I've never done abs before in my life and it was unbelievable how tight everything felt. And that's all the way around. Just from doing that, just from doing that stuff, not any direct ab work, just from doing all the stabilization stuff was really, really nice. So it's, it's something I, I really believe in. And uh, you, know, I want, I, you will see me continue to push this product because I want to help people better, be better. And uh, you know, I, I told this story to Ed because I'm like, Ed, I had shoulder problems for like eight years. My shoulders hurt every day. 
I, I had trouble sleeping at it's night. so frustrating. I'd sleep the wrong way and my arms would go dead. And if this way I would hurt and I couldn't fall asleep. And then you know when you bench the, or something that it's going to hurt. I won't name names, but there's some really good mobility stuff and some shoulder reseating stuff out there. And I was doing those. And they worked. They worked great. I'd walk into the gym and I'd do them, boom, boom, boom. Oh, yeah, no pain. And I'd jump and I'd get through and I'd be like, first heavy set, pain's back. Do it again. Ah, pain's gone. Another so, set. And then yeah. I just keep doing it. And I never, I never address the root. So, yeah, is that in that respect, it never, you solve some of the symptoms but never cured. I, I got the immediate relief and then it would go right back. And, uh, and uh, so this was a few years ago and I started playing around with this. And at the same time, I was playing around with those other concepts. And I'm like, let's, let's put this together. Let's put it together and see what happens. And I did that for a month and my shoulder pain disappeared. And it has been gone for years and I'm looking never forward come back. to that so much. So, Just uh, be able to feel my pecs work again. Cause you know, cause there's so much shoulder pain that the, the pecs don't really fire the next day. Uh, I, like I have to get on a pec machine and do a ton of flies and stuff just to get a pump in my pecs. So they're sore the next day. Cause I, the next day after benching and inclines and stuff, the only thing that gets sore is my shoulder to kill me. So in a nutshell, the shoulder rock is a modern play on a, on, a, on, a, on a classic device with the integration of new clinical science that we've got in place and developed specifically for strength athletes. Cool. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, your audience uh, online is a bit more mature than the typical you know, person with a large social media following. And I think uh, this is one of the reasons as to why. And you're, you're, a lot of people who are at the top of the game are looking to you recently. Your popularity has been growing. They've been looking to you because of these methods. Where do you, where do you see yourself taking this? Um, so when I, I do want to you know, say thanks to the audience that I have. A lot of people comment. They're like, man, you, your, your, your audience is not very big for the quality of content that you put out. Like there's, you know, Joe Trainer with 100,000 views. Because they like, don't you know, know yet. And I'm like, Yes, but look at the people that watch my videos because I know who they are. Because they comment get... and they send me messages, and I'm like, you know, all, you know, a ton of the best athletes and trainers, and you know, it's these are the key people in the sport that are looking to people and doing the training out there are coming to me for their for their help. Yeah, and the quality, the cream of the crop, will stay up there for a long period of time and get passed on, but like for. I mean, look at the, the football players, baseball players. Uh, some, some of the uh, – uh, Kane just got hit into the boards and he's out for 12 weeks. With, he needed uh, – broke his collarbone and stuff like that. Stuff that a lot of these high-level, extremely multi-million dollar contract, ath contract athletes have is – in their contracts is what happens when they get hurt? What happens to the team? They do little things like just the, the shoulder rock and some of the stability stuff, how much healthier they can stay for a longer period of time where they help their team out, where they make millions of more dollars. I think it's pretty uh, easy so, to see what you should do. So I, I'm very passionate about this. I believe I have a message to share. And I get positive feedback around the world every day of getting people out of pain, moving them forward with their lifts. And I want to share that. And I want to help people get better. And so I need to figure out how to do that. And that's, that's the process that I'm working through right now. Yeah. And but like, like most people would say is I am not a paid endorser. What did I say when you said you're going to give me a shoulder rock? Uh, I, I, I've been trying to give Ed a shoulder rock and he is refusing. I'm going to pay for it. You know why? Because I believe in it and he's given me so much already and taught me that it, it's worth it. Why can't I buy it? Like, you know how much money people spend? on some bullshit supplements that don't work, some of the crap out there, some of the uh, extremely high-priced uh, thermal bullshit that they have to take to get themselves hyped up where they can't even think before a workout, how much they pay for that in a month, and a shoulder rock costs, what, like $169 or whatever like that. Look at that, and it'll last your lifetime. That thing will last your lifetime. 30 years, 40 years, that same device. Yeah, you've had the quality in your hands. It's yeah. <laughs> and you get to use it all the time, every day if you want, and never have shoulder problems and some other stability issues forever. Duh.
that's it. It's pretty easy. It's well, well worth it, guys. Like I said, I'm not a paid endorser. I'm a Chris fan because of the quality of man he is and the quality of information he's given out. So I believe in it. Wow. Thank you, Ed. Thank, thank you. It's easy to say when it's the truth. So a couple questions for the both of you, being uh, uh, lifters and having been in the in the powerlifting in the in the powerlifting world for a while. Uh, what do you guys think about the current state and direction of the sport um, as lifters? Uh, there's a lot of whiny ass pussies out there. It's like try to get yourself better. Don't worry about anybody else, and you won't have a problem. Worry about your own lifts, not whatever, not what the uh, current uh, uh, Joe Bag of Donuts uh, Federation has for their record. No, worry about what you can lift. If you get better, that's part of your journey where you succeed is getting better. You can only lift what your body's capable of each training cycle. That's it. You can't lift up here yet. But if you start here, each time, all of a sudden, you're getting to be up there next to the big guys. I looked up to Kaz. When I first started lifting, I saw Arnold on TV and Pumping Iron. Him and Franco, and I bought their books. I went in a bodybuilding contest before they even had music. I'm out there posing to everything Franco did because he was the short guy. And then I realized, oh, I really don't like this diet stuff. And I like being strong. I really like getting strong. So I ran away from Arnold because he was 6'2". And he's freaking Arnold. So I geared towards Franco. Franco was the strong guy. He was built really well. So I figured, you know what? I'm going to try this powerlifting thing after I saw Kaz and Larry Pacifico on TV. I was like, you know what? These guys don't have to diet that hard. And they're monsters and they're strong as hell. That's what I want. So I figured, you know what? If I can be the strongest guy that I can be, I'm going to look pretty damn good. So that's all I did. I strove to get better and better each time out. I didn't strive to, to lift a million pounds. I just wanted to get better. And it just lasted a long time. So I got better up to there. That's all it is. And I think that reflects very well on the state of powerlifting today because so many people are concerned with what everybody else is doing, what everybody else sees. And that's some of our issues. And a lot of it is surrounding social media as well. You know, people think they have yeah. all these expectations on them because they're supposed to perform at a certain level. and. They're going to disappoint their fans. How many family, likes can I get? Family. And you know what? Just, just worry about it. Lift and have fun. Yeah. You know, if it's, it's fun, you lift a lot more weight than if you're a miserable bastard. We're, we're in this because it's fun. It's not because, you know, I, you know, you see stuff that we talk about, you know, I, I call myself the Kabuki warrior, right? But, you know, when I'm up to the bar, I try to get pumped. I think about those sorts of thoughts. But don't take it beyond that. We're... You know, we do this because it's fun. And so a lot of people get too caught up in that stuff. And, but if you go and you spend time with like the top lifters in the sport, you'll Those find pretty that, cool. You'll find out that they're pretty cool people. Yeah. And they don't care about all that junk. And they're on that same, they're on a different level. They're not the people that are online going, whining about this and that and this federation and that judging and such and such. And, you know, all this politics, those seems to be, kind of the nobodies of the sport, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a big difference between the performers and, you know, the the, the, the talk and stuff that yeah, you see. Yeah, take your time. And, and as far as federations, I don't care. If they're good lifters and they're nice people, that's what I care about. If you're a dick, okay, you're just a dick that lifts a lot of weight. But if you're a real nice guy, you get a lot more support and you go a lot further. Uh, when, I, when I go to the Arnold Classic this year, they have the USAPL Raw Challenge. I have one of my lifters lifting in it, and I want him to do fantastic. And I talked to Blaine Sumner and some of the other guys, and they're some of the nicest guys I can ever imagine. And then I go to a, watch some of Mark Bell's meets. I watch Stan lift. I went to the, the, the GPA Worlds. I go to the GPC stuff uh, in Australia or some of the other meets back home, the, the USPF that I've been part of with Lance Carabell and, or an APF meet. And it's fun because the lifters make it fun. As long as everyone enjoys himself, what's the big thing? I don't care. I really don't care where anyone lifts. And, and I think, again, too many people put too much self-imposed expectations out there. You'll notice, one, I hardly ever tell people when I'm going to do a meet in advance. And part of that is because I actually never know. Because you don't my, know. my schedule is actually really hectic and the fact that I can actually get a competition in 
oftentimes I don't even know until right up at the end. And I've got sacrifices with my training plan and whatnot. But the other piece is, you'll notice I never, ever state what I'm going to do before the meet. People will, you'll read posts, oh, they'll find out I'm doing a meet. Or what do you, I, and I hate it, honestly. What are you open with? What are you shooting for? What, what's, what's your second attempts? What's your third attempts? I will not answer because I don't know till after but, my but, first attempt what I it is what and, I what I'm going to do and, and and I don't want like this set of expectations out there that people think that I have like that's honestly none of your business um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go find out what I'm gonna do I'm not gonna know till I get there um, and yeah, yeah I probably, the I probably is way I probably than, have some ideas in my head yeah. but I'm not gonna put it out there so that you know I feel if I get there and I go oh well I'm not quite. Yeah, you know, the way I was, like, oh, and but I, anything, but I said, but but I said right. online I was going to go for that 900 pound squat, so I better, you know. Yeah. No, it's just, just the day to meet. That. Too many people. The day to meet for everyone is different than training in your gym around all your buddies and stuff. When you have weigh-ins, when you have time restraints, when you have different equipment, when you have a different stage, when you have judges that don't know you, or judges that are going to be strict on you, it's a different set of circumstances. So all you do is you set your first attempt on what you on what you know you could do that'll be nice and easy. And then how did that feel? Okay, my second attempt is this. How did that feel? So all you can do is on the day. There have been times in, when I didn't hit what I wanted to, even though I went three for three in a squat, I didn't hit what I wanted to, but I hit what I could that day. It's a big difference. So at GPA Worlds going in, I had some ideas in my head of what I wanted to do. I came nowhere close to those. But at the same time, I walked away very happy because once I understood the set of parameters that I had to work around, I reset my expectations at a totally different amount, and I was very happy and proud of what I accomplished. Yeah, you, even you, though you grew as a lifter and stuff, even though and I was you learned significantly less as far as what I had hoped to, to hit as far as the total. And too many people, they talk too much before they do a meet about what they're going to do. Yeah. They have they it's, just, it's online, all the guys that max out every week and scream and yell. And so that's another piece. I you know state of the sport. Save I guess. your energy, lift in the meet, have fun, let your lift in on the platform do all the talking. So uh, Ed, uh, you don't seem to have let up, and Chris, you're at the prime or close to the prime of your career, uh, and it's obvious from your responses that vanity or ego or attention doesn't motivate you guys. Uh, so what what what's driven you? Uh, in your career to get this far through all the injuries, not just when you're, you know, on the podium, trying to get better, but in the darker moments, the harder moments, the trying day. to get better. It's, but, but it, it, it's actually, it's some of it is a mental release. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not only Ed Cohen, a powerlifter that's on stage or in the gym. I'm a regular guy. That's it. You know, I, I can't do any of the shit he does with engineering or anything. I can lift weights really good. I, can't work on a car. I can't do plumbing. So someone's going to be better at me than something else. And there's going to be someone along that's going to break my records. Okay, cool. As long as you do it the right way, what the hell do I care? What motivates me is me wanting to be in the sport because I love it. Um, I've slowed down physically. My enthusiasm is still there, but parts of me weren't cooperating for a while. Now maybe they'll cooperate a little more and I'll, I'll lift a little more. But, uh, I'm still going to be Ed Cohen, the lifter. I'm still going to be Ed Cohen, the regular guy. That that part's not going to change. It never will. And you know, I'm I'm lucky to have met Bill Kazmaier and call him my friend, Larry Pacifico and call him my friend. God knows how many other guys and call him my friend. That's a really cool thing, and that's part of the journey that I've been on. I love it. I have fun doing it, and I've met some of the best people in my life through this sport. I have, I have such solid support, and it's just the community that I love being part of, um, and it's a way of, for me, testing myself and knowing whether I've still got it. You know, when I walk into the gym, you know, I know that I'm not soft if I, and only I know it. You know, it's nobody else. Nobody knows whether I put everything into what I've got and how hard I pushed it, uh, but I know, and it's a test of who I am and uh, uh, that's important to me and not being mediocre is important to me so uh, I just 
Like it's very, it's my, it's my outlet for trying to, to be exceptional in, in some manner. And I think everybody should. We're all average people, but we, we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't, you know, strive for just, you know, sitting on the, sitting on the couch on Sundays watching football is, that's the, that's the highlight of our week, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, I, I just, it, I don't know how people just kind of let life live them. You know, it's like years, I come and go from my job, you know, I, you know, it's just like life just rolls on and happens to them and they've never pushed themselves. They've never found out who they are. They've never, they've never tried to do something. And this is my outlet for that. You can pick anything. It doesn't matter. But don't be fucking lame. Be exceptional. This is how I try to do that. Yeah, be exceptional for you. You can only do it. You can, if, if your capabilities are to be able to squat 400 pounds and you do it and you fulfill what your capability is, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? I'm not going to be Chris Duffin. I'm not going to be Chad Wesley Stiffer, uh, Smith or Andre Milanichev. I'm just going to be Eddie Cohen, and I've got to worry about what I can do. Not, I don't got to worry about what they can do. I want to, I mean, sure, I want to lift this amount as far as uh, I want to beat everybody, but the reality is, is I can only lift what I can lift, and I got to be happy with it. So that part of your journey is I'm, I'm happy with the way um, most of it turned out. Pretty much, uh, little screw ups along the way, and that's okay. You learn who your friends are, and. Uh, I admit my misgivings, and I admit some of the stuff I did really, really well. And uh, I got no problems with the, any of it. it. Took me to be here. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, a couple of questions from uh, some of the lifters uh, at Elite here that they messaged to me um, that they they wanted me to ask. Are you guys willing to answer some? Yes, yeah, anything. Good. Cool. I think we got another 15 minutes or so. Uh, uh, any encouragement for someone who's new to the sport or just getting into it, falling in love with it, starting out? Simple advice. They're the same as we used to be. No different. It's, you know, okay, I want to do this. They're, they're fortunate, especially here, where they have Chris and a huge support crew to lead them in the right direction so they don't make a lot of mistakes that we had to meet, uh, you know, have on the way up with um, – injuries and stuff like that so they can avoid a lot of that and have a little more fun doing it because like you said you're the way you teach them is they're not going to have the possibilities of getting as many aches and pains from the very beginning and everything's going to be perfect so it's it's going to be more fun for you guys because he's leading the way i think uh, it's important for people to not look again it could be you know because everything's so prevalent on social media or you know here at the gym looking at some of the elite lifters and going wow, I'm not at that level, I'm nothing. And having some, you know, it takes time and you've got to just stay with it. And, uh, you know, focus on the small things. Focus on whether you're better next week. Are you better mm-hmm. the week after that? Are you better this month over last month? And taking those small wins and celebrating them and knowing that you're making progress and, and do the math on it and go, wow, if I did this year over year, where would I be 10 years from now? Yeah. And uh, you know, realizing what that is, and uh, you know, take, taking that taking that away. Uh, another question: How do you guys uh, stay mentally engaged and committed during plateaus in your training? You learn. You you, you, you go back in your training. Like I, I used to write, hand write everything out. Uh, where did I go wrong? Why did I get this plateau? And you figure it out. Maybe sometimes being honest with yourself about your weak points is pretty hard. But when you do it, it's like, oh, my God. And then you solve it. It's like, why didn't I do that before? Why did I freaking wait so long? And that, that's, that, that's what it is. It's I want to get better. I don't quit because things get hard. It amps me up to try to find ways to get better. That's all it is. That's that tinkering piece for me again. It's like, how do I figure out a way? You know, I've got a lot of issues to overcome between my elbows and my hands and this and that. I can whine and moan about them. But I keep trying to figure out a way because I'm going to figure out a way to work around it. And, yeah. and, and that's, it might not be perfect, but it's going to get better. I'm going to figure out a way. And when I do it, awesome! Thing, it's going to be awesome, right? And, uh, you know, it's uh, we were talking about this earlier, uh, or maybe it was yesterday, going, 
you know, there's some of the guys that every now and again you see somebody, they're like, oh, they're going to be the next greatest person in the sport. Yeah. And you see them lift for a year and they make tons of gains and then they hit that plateau and they're done. They're done. It's like, ah, yeah. Either they quit because it got hard or they get injured. Yeah. And that's, it's, that's what separates, you know, the, 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 champ. great, the champs from, from the has-beens. And uh, so that's the question you have to ask yourself is, are you going to persevere and figure out a way and continue to work through this and figure out how to overcome it? Are you a champion? Do you want to learn? Do you want to take advice? Do you want to try to get better? Speaking of uh, injuries, between the both of you, you've got quite a long list of them, I'm sure. So you'd be really uh, fit to answer this question. Uh, yeah, list them. <laughs> list, list your injuries. <laughs> okay. okay. What, what yeah. have you guys found to be helpful for preventing injuries and training and competing? Well, now after I learned stuff today is different than before. Before it was like, okay, stretch, warm up properly, blah, blah, blah. Maybe ice, stretch afterwards. And then I think it developed into uh, a lot of foam rolling, some massage, I used to get massages. And now it's way different. I was not in the right position to do certain things over long periods of time that ended up causing more problems. Like I never, had a shoulder injury where it didn't pop, it didn't tear. It's just all of a sudden over time that that 220 line is only working at 110 where they don't flex that hard anymore. Where when I bench, I don't, my shoulders get sore, but my flex, my pecs don't flex. Well, there wasn't an injury there, but it was a gradual misperformance or mismovement and lost mobility over time that caused a chain of events to happen. So that's where I was and where I am. So for me, I've got uh, I've got a few injuries. I'll uh, run through them really fast, and when you make question, well, how the hell are you the uh, the movement guy or the guy that uh, is helping people if you if all you're doing is hurting yourself? Uh, but that's what sent me down this path, and uh, uh, to try to figure this out for myself and all how to prevent it from others. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've detached uh, both heads of this pet. Uh, had them surgically reattached. Um, some major uh, uh, groin tear uh, several years ago. Both of these elbows um, I've had surgery on to try to fix, but there's uh, floating bodies, arthritis, uh, overgrowth uh, around the, the joint, um, just lots of issues in there. Basically worn out because I used to lack shoulder mobility, which happened because I had core issues. So some oblique tear, uh, strains and things like that in, that, in those areas. Um, but uh, the last few years, as I've been putting this stuff into place, injuries have been pretty damn minimal. Oh, uh, detached uh, this bicep as well, which was a result of uh, elbow issue again. It's put a lot of stress on it when your arm's like that. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what's put me, put me on this path. Yeah. And, um, a lot of them was, uh, I was also learning to set my ego aside in the gym. I do, and I, I still struggle with and trying to figure out how to manage myself from... Uh, yeah, because when it feels really I, good, it's sometimes it's hard to hold back. But at the same time, it's like, write it down, know where you're at right now, know where you want to end up, and stick to your plan. Yep, and that's, and that's something that is a continual learning process. I'm much better as a coach with that than I am as an athlete. I'm, well, I'm actually a much better coach anyway than an athlete. Um, a lot of people- you Must be a damn good coach then, huh? <laughs> but uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people think of me as just the, uh, as the athlete, but I think the EPC members and actually people in the business environment that I work with, that's, that's, that's what I do. I specialize in getting people to achieve things that they've never achieved before. And as part of that, I, I have achieved good success myself, but I am, I, I struggle with some of that when it comes to a personal level. And, and uh, I'm putting some play, tools in place, and I have over this last couple of years that have helped me there. A lot of uh, using some of the velocity-based training stuff and the devices available to manage my training so I know I've got, got feedback from parameters that, damn it, I said this is it. And, uh, you know, that's where, that's where I call it. I, rem I remember my first uh, powerlifting meet. I was scared to death. And I'm sure this is the same for most lifters, and maybe it was the same for you guys. But as experienced lifters, what could you, uh, what advice could you give to someone, uh, you know, with the pre-meet nerves? How do you, how do you guys handle that? Just it, if you have someone to help you, make sure you 
have all your warm-ups set and start early enough where you can time them right, and then everything else is pretty easy. The meat will go at as planned as if you rush, if you have to rush and don't get a warm-up in, or if you start too early and you get cold, it screws everything up and it, it, it's not easy to recover from there. It's your first meet. Relax. Take a nice, easy warm-up. Take a nice, easy opener and enjoy the experience of your first meet. You're not going to be a record holder your first meet. So just enjoy it. Try to go nine. You're a power lifter, so try to go nine, four, nine. Make every attempt. Don't go out there and try to max out your first attempt. Just relax and have fun. This is almost exactly similar to what I was going to say. Um, I tell people, because this comes up all the time, we have tons of new lifters at EPC, tons of new lifters at our meets. When we hold meets, they're usually like 50%, sometimes 75% new lifters into the sport. And so this comes up all the time. Emails from lifters that are going, this is my first meet. And it's very common that people are worried that they're going to not lift enough to be in a meet or be embarrassed or whatever. And you just have to explain to them that it doesn't matter. You're there for yourself yeah. and nobody's going to care. And you're going to, you're not going to believe me and you're not going to realize it till the meet's over and, and then you'll get it. But this first meet isn't going to be a big success for you. No, just you're try, not going to hit try to have fun. So what you, all you need, all you should try to accomplish in this first meet is learn the flow of a powerlifting meet and how you respond and set some other alternative goal, such as going nine for nine. Um, and then I uh, usually tell them that, you know, let them know that you, you may not sleep the night before because of the nervous jitters. This is very normal. So again, uh, I still that, don't sleep the night before. Exactly. So, it, so, so again, if that happens there, you know, they're freaked out. They know that this is just part of it. So that's, I just try to share that as experiences from my first meets and the people that, you know, I've done. And that, uh, that usually helps people trying to get them past the, I'm not strong enough. I'm not going to do a meet until I can hit a 2000 total or a 1500 total or a, you probably will never like, do a one then. It, it, it's like, you, you, you don't have that be your first meet goal because you're not going to do it at your first meet. So plan on that. If you're really strong or whatever it is, that's your second or third meet. So your first meet, go learn how the flow is so that you can actually accomplish that at the next one. Do the lifts in the gym. The same way you're going to have to do them in a meet. How many videos do we see on Facebook now where guys do a squat, it's a mile freaking high, or the deadlift is hitched all the way up, and guys, you have all his buddies with the next 20 comments are like, beast mode, you're an animal, that was fantastic, you rock, you're easily going to do this. It's like, it's so full of crap that you don't have the right people behind you watching you. And then if someone posts and says, you know what, that was just a little high, maybe you should try this. Something really nice and yet just even though it was, it was critical, it's constructive. And then everyone goes off on the guy. You don't know shit. You don't. It's like, what are you talking about? What are you seeing on these, some, on these damn videos? And there's so much of that, it's just ridiculous. It's a sign look of, at, yeah, look at what the standards are of what you're supposed to do. You know what? Every federation, when you look at the rule of depth, is actually the same on paper. That same diagram has been used for years. Follow it. So on, on that note, if anybody needs advice, it's the uh, Internet Keyboard Warriors. And you guys seem to be really, you know, lit up by that. Any advice for people who just uh, sit on, on Facebook and make comments on videos about stuff like that? Just don't, don't give a guy the wrong information. Just say, well, you, you look really strong, but you should maybe, you know, you, you could probably get it down a little more if you're going to do a meet. If he's not doing a meet, it doesn't really matter then, does it? But if he is, it's like, just be honest with people. You could be honest and still be nice. You don't have to say that much exactly. soft. There's a, yeah, there's a big You could say, wow, you know, you really handled the weight well and you look really strong, but you're going to have to drop it down a little bit at a meet. And most people say, yeah, I know. There's a big difference between jabbing somebody in the eye and just trying to be a dick about it. Yeah. And providing some good critical feedback. I mean... It happens here at EPC all the time where I want we, we, I want my training partners to be honest with me. But you know, at the same time, I know when I screw up and it's hard to admit it. And when they tell you to you, it might get a little bite, but then you really, okay, I know I didn't do this. This is what I should have done. I know I missed it. That's all. It's a big deal. It's called learning. Okay, cool. So this next question, I'm not sure... Uh... 
you guys are the right uh, subject matter experts considering we just spent the whole week eating, a weekend eating large amounts of delicious food. Not we. Yeah. yeah. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. And, uh, I, I saw the guy with his shirt off. He still has all his abs and all his stuff. So he still looks phenomenal. So he just went on a little eating binge for a while and he's going back on his diet on meat. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> going back on tomorrow. So uh, any uh, advice uh, related to diet? Here was always my advice. I made sure I got all the nutrients I was supposed to, and if I wanted, if I wanted to cheat, if it was the per, it, within the parameters of my weight at the time, whether you know getting ready for a meet or whatever weight class I was going into, I cheated. Plain and simple. Made sure I got all my nutrients in. If I wanted to cheat, I cheated. Plain and simple. That's it. So I, I've got some advice, dude. This is just general. This is not like, you know, this is how you're going to get super lean. This is whatever, but. In general, from a powerlifting standard, I'm fairly fairly lean and fairly strong, right? Um, here's just some basic stuff. Eat with a rhythm. Start with your greens, move to your meats, and then have your carbs after that. Always double up your meat. Anytime I go to a restaurant or somewhere, I order an extra patty, an extra serving of meat, whatever it is. And there's something, oh, well, you can't digest that much protein. Well. Maybe you believe that or maybe you don't, but it doesn't matter. You're still going to fill up with more protein. Your body's going to you accept are. so much. Exactly. So you're going to fill out with the right nutrients first. So so you, why, why the greens first? Um, same thing. Just filler. You know, make sure you get your micronutrients. And again, They don't fill fillers, you up as much. But, it, but if you have your carbs first, well, the, car, the carbs will fill you up. You won't be able to eat as much. Well, you know, meat, you'll right? end up eating more carbs. Okay. It's just a natural. That rhythm helps control your macros as a whole. Okay. Um, so it's going to preference you for more for more. For more proteins and more animal-based proteins, and reduce the reduce the carbs. Carbs are still good. Uh, as an athlete, you need carbs, but you know it's going to help control those those macros a little bit better. Anything and make sure on, like, that you're the, the types of carbs, where they come from, that are better than others. I mean, if you want to still be, you want obviously you want quality. So would you stay away from somewhere like your breads, or would you? Would you get them more from like rice and sweet potatoes and all your veggies and stuff like that, or? Um, you know, I'm I'm not a big you know like sweet potato you know yeah. chicken and sweet potato guy like, uh, but I think we all really know when we're eating good food and when we're eating bad food, right? Yeah, there's so, that being honest with yourself that hurts. So, so you know, I I don't think I need to state the obvious there. You know, if you're sitting there eating a bunch of white bread product and you've got the opportunity for you know, grabbing some whole grains or, you know, it's, uh, as long as it's balanced and you can look in a mirror and see how you look. Exactly. So just some basic, you know, stuff there that, that, that works. Yeah. Stan, Stan Efferding always told me, uh, well, you know, I, I stay pretty lean. If I want to get a little stronger, if I got a meat coming up, I'll just add in more carbs. Pretty so, simple. People, people always give me, they're like, hey, I'll go to eat with people. And I'll have my double or triple patty burgers or whatever it is, yeah. right? They go, you're going to get fat with that. I'm like, yeah, but I'm full and I'm not eating the fries now oh, that shit. you're eating over here because I'm full. And it actually, there's a more thermogenic effect from proteins as well. It, 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 it's very yeah. simple. So now the last few days, I've eaten the triple burger plus the fries plus the dessert. Lardos. Plus the... Lardos. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Ed's going over here. Duffin is full of shit. I've seen it. <laughs> he can uh, not anymore. He's not full of shit. It's been coming out. Believe me. Well, uh, we're we're just about a time out of time. Um, thank you guys. Anything else you'd like to say? No, I just want to thank Chris for having me, and uh, doing his best to to get me better, which I know is going to help me so much more in the long run to be able to lift pain free and be a lot happier lifting. That's what it's all about. He's helping me. And why I've tried to help people all my life. Not to pat myself on the back, but it all comes back on you. It's really easy to be nice. It's hard to be a dick and you're miserable and not you get nothing back ever. So just help people. It's pretty easy. It's nice and easy. It makes you feel good. Thank you for coming out, Ed. It's been Thanks, a pleasure um, getting to know you and spend some time with you. And uh, you've helped me as well. Thank you. Thanks, guys.